Welcome back to Opperton Talks with Henry and Walter. This is your weekly dose of educational fun and inspiration. This week, we have someone who was described by one journalist as a cross between Tinkerbell and the Terminator. At five foot three, Rosie probably isn't your typical explorer. Since the late 90s, she's tackled the North and South Poles with others and alone, as well as many other expeditions from crossing the world's greatest deserts to frozen lakes. An inspiration to future explorers and for anyone with a dream, we are delighted and very grateful to welcome with us Rosie Stancer. Thank you so much for joining us. Hello. Um, we're a children's company. We work with kids. Uh, we believe that every child should have a mentor. I'd like to start by asking you about your childhood. Um, was it obvious as a child that a desk job just wasn't for you? Yes, I think it was because I was a bit of a tomboy. <laughs> and this was largely, I think, brought about because we were, we were in quite a remote part of Northern England when I was very little. And um, we were very much left up to ourselves, i.e. my older brother and myself. My older brother didn't want to play with me, that would have been a bit sissy, to get on with our own thing. So, and also the, the big idea was to escape from a rather stern nanny during the daytime. And this all combined to make me a tomboy. And, and, and were you a, an academic student at school? Did you enjoy school? What were your reports like? They were filthy at prep school, <laughs> to the point that my parents nearly had to remove me politely, leave in a hurry, shall we say. But uh, when it came to the next school, I actually turned over a new leaf, largely out of a sense of competition, because my BF, my best friend, was incredibly brainy. And so I got very competitive and diligent. And I worked, I worked very hard. I had to work very hard because I'm not very clever. <laughs> no, I'm sure that's not true. Was there, was there a light bulb moment when you thought, I want to be an adventurer? What was that like and how did you get into it? It was a light bulb moment, and it's a very unscientific, um, unsensational explanation, which was just, I recognized an opportunity, and I wanted to seize it, and I knew without question that this was the right thing for me to do. It was, it was going to be a path that was going to lead on to great things, and indeed it did. At last, I found myself in the right element, not behind a desk. <laughs> and, and, and is it a vocation? When did it become a vocation rather than, a, than, a, than something else? Do you know, I think it became a, a vocation right at the very embryonic stages on the first selection process for the first team on that initial expedition. Perhaps you could tell us a little bit about that process. What was that first expedition like for you and how did it come about? I loved it, and it was uh, it was a very bold, British, eccentric expedition because it was made up of twenty totally amateur women. None of us really knew the difference between a tent peg and a clothes peg, <laughs> and the the whole country actually got behind us. Everyone was very supportive, and uh, we relayed our way because none of us had the time nor the money to go all the way to the North Pole. So we relayed there and, and it was a triumph against all odds. But can it I shows ask, what you can do. Absolutely. Can I ask, you moved from some of those team expeditions onto more of the solo trips. Why did you make that decision and, and, and how did the two compare, I suppose? Um, I wanted to intensify the experience and I wanted to learn more. So all those skills that I had admired in other teammates, I wanted to hone for myself, which I hadn't up until that date because I was quite happy to leave them to do it. I was frightened of not being able to do it. So I saw that as the challenge to get over that fear and to become self-sufficient. Uh, and apart from that self-sufficiency and, and the kind of sense of overcoming things, uh, you mentioned at the beginning your slight uh, nascent anti-establishment with your primary school. For any burgeoning adventurers out there listening, what are the key attributes or characteristics do you think that make up someone as successful as you in terms of the, the industry in which you work? Well, both 
both your head and your heart as to what you are trying to achieve because that's where the strength lies whether it's whether it's polar expeditions or whether it's in a business route it's it's here and it's here so if you're very clear about where you're heading and you have a passion for it that passion will propel you through all your fears and your self-doubts that's a that's a very eloquent way to put it being out there on your own i'm sure is far less glamorous than people might think Perhaps you can take us through the experience of being in the middle of nowhere on your own on a solo expedition. What's that moment like and is it fun? I was always utterly transported the moment I realised I was totally on my own. And also not a little relieved because I knew there was no one around to see me make a total idiot of myself. <laughs> um, but it's interesting because it's... It, feels much more comfortable to be absolutely on your own than if somebody's watching you, even with a tracking system. And again, it's intensifying that purpose while you're out there to be solo, because it's not just a geographical expedition and it's not just a physical challenge. It's, it's a psychological and spiritual voyage as well. Does that mean when you get home, you're itching to get out again? There must be peaks and troughs of... Of happiness therefore in your life there are i mean this little transport i described when you land on the ice and the little twin otter flies away and you're totally on your own on five million square miles of ice lasts for about five minutes <laughs> and then you think you want to go home and why didn't anyone make me sign a contract saying i'd never do it again um but when you get back home you miss the ice. So when you're on the ice, you miss home and vice versa. It's always like having taken a, a bite of the apple in the Garden of Eden. It's the price that, that you pay. Can I ask, I mean, are there then moments of loneliness or do you push past that? Does it become just totally natural to you after those, that first day, let's say? No, I mean, always after the first day, you begin wishing that a particular teammate was there who's good at fixing your broken stove or, or navigating whatever it was until you learn to cope and that you can cope. And also, interestingly, um, you might be all on your own, but I never felt lonely. I always had a, a sense, of, um, sense of company in a very nice way. You, you've tackled the North Pole, you've tackled the South Pole. What would you say your greatest challenge has been? And can you take us through that? The North, the North Pole. People lump, despite even Attenborough's programs, people tend to lump Antarctica and the Arctic together. And they tend to think of it as huge areas of big flat ice plains and big blue skies, and neither are really like that. Um, the difference is that obviously Antarctica is a, is a continent with a huge great ice cap, like a big ice cloche on it. So it tends to be slightly smoother, but windier and colder. Whereas the Arctic is a frozen ocean. It's just like a crust of ice on an ocean which gets shoved in different directions with the ocean currents and the winds. So yeah, they're ripping apart. So the whole place is like a big um, yard of ice rubble and you get walls up to 50 feet high of piles of rubble of ice. So it's noisy, violent and dangerous. And you have to ski it, walk it, climb it, swim it to get to the North Pole. They, they, they say, Rosie, that the worst moment of an Olympian's life is winning gold medal. Is there a similar feeling with, with expeditions like the ones you do? Um, I, think, I think when you get your, your medal, when you get to the end, it's not how you expect it's going to be. It's something that you've fantasized about your metaphorical medal. It's great. I love that. That's Throughout the expedition. But when you get there, 
it's an awful anticlimax. And I found myself riddled with feelings of, of the imposter syndrome. <laughs> I shouldn't have got away with that. And I'd say that actually the quote is, I don't agree with the quote, because I think that for a lot of Olympians and, and before an expedition, the worst possible moment is just before you leave. That's when you're riddled with um, the real fear of the worst fear of all, which is imminent failure and making a fool of yourself. And amazing thoughts. Listening to you speak about the North Pole, you've clearly been more at one with nature than the rest of us combined. How have your experiences across your career shaped your understanding of nature and the world around us, particularly given climate change and everything in the news today? Um, I think that nature is not something that in the adventure books you can't conquer it i've seen the power of it it's wrong to say that you go with nature and when you translate that into other realities on this planet you, we should be going with nature and even though it can be harsh and cruel it's it's breathtakingly beautiful and, and very clever and i think that one of the benefits of whether it's an expedition or in a way the, the, the expeditional challenge that everybody's been going through with COVID is it has opened people's eyes up a little bit more to the wonderful things about the, the, the world which we live in and to hopefully treat it with a bit more reverence. Hmm. Can I ask, you're, you're a parent too. Um, a lot of people say that is the greatest challenge of life you've clearly been an inspiration to your son as well, I'm sure. How do you balance the role of being a mother with being an inspiration as well in all your life and work? Well, first of all, um, it's very easy for anyone to, to make excuses uh, not to juggle important balls in life and fulfill their, their, their goals. Um, they're never insurmountable if you really believe in your goal. And it's very important that every individual should um, pursue something in life that leaves a legacy, not just to their children, but to everyone else as well. And that legacy has got to be one that's inspirational and one of learning that as many people as possible can benefit from. Your, your legacy will, will continue to be developed. Uh, I know next year you're off to China. Is that the plan? There's a desert, which I can't pronounce. Yeah. And you'll tell me how to pronounce it, but I gather it's the, it's sort of, I think the name means, you know, once you enter, you won't come out. Can you tell us about that trip you're planning on doing? Well, the Takla Makan. The Takla Makan is China's biggest desert. Everyone thinks it's the Gobi, but it's not. It's the Takla Makan, which also happens to be the second largest dune desert in the world, the Sahara. So it's full of massive dunes. Um, however, that is, if I'm not mixing up my metaphors, on ice because, uh, <laughs> because first of all, because of COVID in China lockdown, and in that area where the desert lies, Xinjiang, there's a big, ugly political problem with the Muslims and a lovely indigenous people there called the Uyghurs. Um, and there's a, um, a controversial issue over cultural genocide that the Han Chinese are carrying out. So uh, I am going to a desert, but it's a different one. It's a new one, and it's called the Aral Kum in Kazakhstan. So we're crossing the Aral Kum next year in the meantime, rather than sitting idle. Can I ask a sort of final big question? What's the greatest challenge for an explorer outside of being in the moment there? What's the, what's the toughest thing about your job? Starting. <laughs> I thought you might say that. It must be a total mission getting these things organised and getting them together. It is a total mission, but it is so true that that, that old chestnut that everyone knows about, uh, any great journey begins with the first step, because it's like the first step over a big black crevasse, because it's stepping into the unknown, which is what we're all terribly frightened of. But once you start work, working on those boring old logistics and that grubby fundraising, you're, you're already on your way, you know, so it becomes real. 
And Rosie, can I ask before we get to our uh, quick fire round, um, it would be churlish not to ask about the commercialization of being an adventurer. In the age of social media and Instagram, I'm sure there are frustrations um, with or, f or by those who are very active outside of the screen and not so much on Instagram, but who don't have the same reputation as those who perhaps are very good at Instagram and less good on ice. What's your take on, on being an explorer in the age of kind of social media? I think it's very important that you feel and that you know in your own heart that what you're doing is a genuine in endeavor. And one must do one's best not to be too much of a dinosaur um, and embrace modern technology. And I say this myself as somebody who struggles with it because it's the way that you share that legacy I mentioned, your, your learning. And uh, when it comes to others who perhaps are questionable on what they really have achieved, and shall we say that they're <laughs> more glory merchants? Well, at the end of the day, they know what they have and they haven't achieved. But if they are succeeding in igniting something in other people, particularly children, who get ideas from what they've been talking about, then it's not all bad, is it? I agree. Mark, well, share the legacy. Share the legacy. So yeah. to finish, we've got just a handful of quick fire questions. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to start, which is, who are your favourite explorers? Ooh, first of all, a Norwegian woman called Liv Arneson, who was the first woman to reach the South Pole in record time, really, really sort of sweltered after, after all these big hairy blokes were doing it in 70 days and she did it in 64 back in the 90s. Yeah, go live. Um, I also think uh, that somebody called uh, Margaret Mead, who was a botanist, uh, the fan de siècle, and went down the Amazon all on her own, um, painting uh, plants very well as well. I mean, what a plucky thing to do, especially in a time when there wouldn't have been a, 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 a warm reception back at home for her because everyone would have been tut tutting. And um, and then I should really pick a man because I don't want to sound feminist, but I think um, the best contemporary polar explorer and possibly the best ever in my view is somebody called Borga Ausland, who again I'm afraid is Norwegian, um, but then Norwegians are polar exploration. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Well, lots to lots to research when we've uh, when we got off this. Uh, next one, Rosie, your most treasured possession. Uh, when I'm on an expedition or in real life? Uh, let's go in real life. Okay. I, it's a, it's um, a laminated picture that my son drew when he was about five of butterflies and caterpillars and rainbows. And on the back is a message from my husband. And they did it for me to take with me on my solo expeditions. So does it answer both halves of the question too? What would be your most treasured possession? I want to know the other one <laughs> on expedition. <laughs> well, that along with something else which didn't weigh very much, which was a, a, a prayer of uh, protection. Excellent. My go, I think. Mm -hmm. um, your biggest bugbear. Oh, my biggest bugbear would be um, would be myself not being uh, very apt at uh, modern technology. That really frustrates me. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> very, very, yeah, good one. And a toughest moment. There must be a, a tough moment that stands out. I'm sure you've had many, but what's been your toughest moment on expedition? Uh, I think when I thought uh, I thought I was going to die and I'd done everything I'd, uh, to get out of the situation and there was nothing left to do. So I had time to think about what I thought was coming my way. <laughs> that was a bit tough. <laughs> can, I, can I go off script and ask what that situation was, if you don't mind briefly explaining um, it? I, I got embroiled in a, a huge ice quake on the Arctic 
ice and I didn't realize it at the time but um some old ice which doesn't normally break up a whole shelf of it was was breaking up over hundreds and hundreds of miles and I got engulfed in it so all these huge walls of ice rubble were collapsing falling down and the ice was splitting open all around me and, and beneath me so I didn't have anywhere to run or hide and I had stashed all my emergency beacon communication equipment cables it's all down my front I'd strapped up my sledges I'd done everything I possibly could I'd got out my safety mitts and and there was nothing left to do except uh, wait and look at the picture that I mentioned with Jock's drawings on I'd strapped to the top of my sledge and used it to focus on <laughs> wow well and final one to finish off you've given us so many trinkets of wisdom but it would be uh, a shame not to ask for one more. Your best piece of advice you can give. Is do follow your dream, but make sure that you follow it with true passion. Well said. We'll leave it there. Before we let you go, we can't let you leave without playing our game. We have a leaderboard, which you will feature on very shortly. And biscuit face is very simple. You have to get a biscuit from your forehead to your mouth without using your hands. So ah. I'm sure of all the things you've had to do in the Arctic, this will be much the easiest. But I would suggest probably removing your glasses and you're trying to get the biscuit from your forehead to your mouth without using your hands. And you've got a 30 second time limit to try and do it. Oh, hang on, I have a question for the umpires. If I can't use my hands, can I use my hands to use a bit of equipment? Perfect. You absolutely you, can. You, you sound like you've cheated and won the game. <laughs> and remember, Rosie, you can you have more than one go. So you have 30 seconds and you can take as many attempts as you'd like. I've, I've got to open the packet first. Well, um, there's no plugging on Offerden Talks, but that biscuit is my favourite biscuit. And it's actually the biscuit that I think gave the record holder the win. So yeah. um, Ooh, it's, you're in good you company. Right. R Rosie, take it away. Okay, yeah. but I can use weapons, right? <laughs> oh, now what do I do? You can have another go. For anyone listening, Rosie is using scissors. <laughs> and she's done it! Rosie, 24 seconds. You go onto the leaderboard. I'm going to go and find the leaderboard. The leaderboard's just round here. A lot of people didn't make it onto the leaderboard. Rosie, you're on our leaderboard. Hey! Well, done very well. And also, you're the first person in all these people who's actually asked if they can use an implement. First one. No, see, no. that's what makes you a great adventurer. So, Rosie... Is you, you can see through the problem. So, you Ooh. go in above Jonah Howard King, uh, who's in the new Disney film. And you go just below um, Louis Hines, who is a uh, also an actor. So there we go. You're, be you're between oh, the two, splitting the young actors. Yeah, right. Yes. You're going to need a proper leaderboard. Who, soon. You have to invest in one. I'm, 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 I'm who's doing. number one? Who's number one? A man with a beard and a hobnob. He did it in six seconds. Extraordinary. I think it was the facial hair that done it. He runs a very good uh, company oh. called Dash Water. How ingenious. Rosie. Use any weaponry either, probably. Yeah, yeah, I know that you are the example to all those out there. Use weaponry if in doubt. Rosie, thank a you so much. Thank we're, you very we're much. Incredibly grateful uh, for those listening. Tune in next week and thank you very much. Goodbye. <laughs>